So I think we're at 11 o'clock and it is Remembrance Sunday. So I think we will, would those who can stand like to stand as we respectfully watch this video together? In 2017, the choir I sing with, along with branches from Hull and Beverly, were invited to take part in the Freedom Flame ceremony in Wageningen in the Netherlands. This was to be the finale of a trip that would take us to the war cemeteries in Belgium, France and Holland, along with the opportunity of singing at the last post ceremony in the Menning Gate. It really wasn't until I went on this trip that I realised the sheer magnitude of two world wars. Walking around cemeteries surrounded by thousands of graves of mainly young men was a stark reminder of the horrors and futility of such conflict. So today we remember all those killed in those and subsequent conflicts and also pray that such huge loss of life will never be seen again and that mankind will find God's peace. During the silence, there'll be a chance to see a few of the photographs of that trip and I hope that these will help us to focus. But of course, if you prefer, feel free to close your eyes and just remember during the two minute silence. They shall not grow old as we who are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them.
Please be seated. I'm sure we all have our memories of, uh, I just reminded me of visiting my great uncle, my mother's uncle's memorial just outside Albert on the Somme. He was um, blown up in 1918 and uh, you visit these beautifully immaculately kept war graves, very moving, lest we should forget, I think. And we're going to take this time and start our service with our prayer time together. A great privilege that we have to come before our Saviour uh, and our Father and our God and pray to him. So let's do that. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for who you are, for your goodness and grace towards us in all that you've done for us through the saving work of the Lord Jesus, Father, that you have set us free, free from the condemnation of the devil and those bounds of our sin. Father, we confess our sin and seek your promised forgiveness and help for us each and every day, particularly today. We give thanks that today in this country we have freedom, freedom to live and freedom to worship. And today give thanks for the lives of all those who fought to secure this in many theatres of war. Help us to strive to bring your peace in all that we do in our lives here on earth. Use us to bring comfort, love and care to all we meet that we may always seek to follow your command to seek your kingdom first. Father, we pray for all those still affected by the atrocity of war, whether through physical or mental illness or through the suffering of bereavement. Pour out your blessing on them and may they know the peace and the love which comes only, only through knowing you. We remember before you all those countries where war and violence and oppression continues and we pray that you would show your grace and use us, your Christian believers, wherever they are in these lands, as channels through which your peace might reign once again. Father, too, we think of this time of the ongoing pandemic and we pray for those that are affected in any way and will know your healing and calm. Help us to care and exhort each other through these times as a witness to the world that does not know that you are sovereign. Father, we thank you. We have the freedom to worship and we pray we might continue to be able to proclaim your gospel in our local area, our nation and support the gospel going out to the ends of the earth. We ask that you would strengthen us all against all attempts to restrain our freedom to do this. Father, we pray for all those who can't be with us today and for whatever reason. And we pray that those who are struggling will know your presence and enabling touch. Holy Spirit, come, fill them in you and give them strength and patience and courage to help them focus on our Saviour who suffered for us and suffers with us. Let's just take a moment or two to lift before our God those who are on our hearts this morning. Father, we thank you that the Lord Jesus was the perfect final sacrifice for mankind for the forgiveness of our sin. And through knowing you, we have the hope of everlasting peace in eternal life with you. We come before you in confession of our trespass and sin this week and call again on your grace-filled promise of forgiveness. As we now come to worship, turn our eyes to you and focus our hearts and minds to bring honour and glory to your precious name. That your name may be hallowed in and from this place. Come amongst us, Father God. And may this time we spend together with one another in your presence be one of blessing. And may we learn more of you and your saving grace. And Father, we pray for Stephen 
as he brings us under the authority of your word. Bring him confidence and boldness as you work through him in sharing your word to us. And we ask that our praise and worship might be an acceptable aroma to you. And we pray all these things through and through the name of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus. Amen. We're going to stand and sing in worship now. We're going to sing together Ancient of Days. This song actually begins, though the nations rage, kingdoms rise and fall, but we've got to remember that there is still one king reigning over all of this chaos. We know it's not chaos really because God is in control. So let's stand together and sing.
Psalm 108, it says these words. My heart, O God, is steadfast. I will sing and make music with all my soul. Awake, harp and lyre, I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love, higher than the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth, all the earth, all creatures of our God and King. Let's lift our voices up and sing together.
They must have known I was going to speak. <laughs> they deliberately hid it. Um, right, I still need some help from the young people, from the children. Would you like to come up here and join me? Good, that's good to see you. And they're coming all over. Coming all over. There's time for you to come. Come on. Right, that's very good. That's one. We have two. Surely there's some. This will be all right. We'll be all right. Oh, there's another one. Excellent, excellent. That's two. Four would be nice. If there's two of you want to come up together, that's all right. Oh, oh. Good. excellent, excellent. Right. Very good. Right. Oh, okay, okay. Right. Now, I'm just going to ask you. Oh, there's another one. All arranged in height size. This is very well organized. Isn't it? <laughs> Good, it's good, very good. Right, now, I think I'll start. Shall I start with you, Dorsa? I know your name, that's right. Do you know what you would like to be when you grow up? Doctor. Sorry? Doctor. A doctor. A doctor. That's good, excellent. We need lots of those. I find I need them more and more as the <laughs> years go by, as the National Health Service expenditure on me grows. Right. Hello, what's your name? A nurse. A nurse? A nurse. Oh, very good, very good. Excellent. What's your name? What do you want to be? Corinna. Yeah. I want to be an inventor. You want to be an inventor? Excellent. You need some of those. Perhaps you could invent a teapot that pours out. <laughs> so, there's all sorts of useful things. That's good. Inventors. We've got a doctor, a nurse, and an inventor. Dancer, you want to be a dancer? That's good. That's good. Right. The arts, the sciences, we've got a lot here. It's good. I would like to be a teacher. You'd like to be a teacher. That's an excellent job. I'm a teacher. So it's a very good job. Yes. Right. So now, oh, don't go yet. Sorry. We've got some pictures to look at yet. Now, um, some people choose a job where you make lots of money, don't they? Well, some people do. And some might choose a job, but you meet lots of people. I suppose you meet a lot of people being a doctor or a nurse, wouldn't you? And uh, some might want to help people, sick people get better, like doctors and nurses. Um, you might help people, like teachers. And some might want to do, do the same job as their mother or father did. Uh, my father was brought up on a farm, and his father was a farm, and his father was a farm, and his father was a farm. As far back as we know, they were farmers, so he decided to become a driving examiner. <laughs> so it doesn't always work out as we expect. Now, I'm going to show you some pictures, and we're going to show some... Um, in a moment, in a moment... Oh, what are you doing? That's, uh, okay. Because um, I wonder if anyone's ever thought, did Jesus ever think about what he was going to do when he grew up? That's what we're going to have a look at. Let's look at the screen up there. Get where you can watch the screen. If you want to sit down, you can. Sit, sit. <laughs> okay, don't go, don't go. Right, now, can any of you tell me what this man is doing? What's he, what's he working with, do you think? This is a bad picture. I shouldn't have chosen this one. But if I told you that was a large lump of wood under him... What, what? Sorry? He's cutting wood. Right, what do we call people who cut wood and make them into planks and beams and that sort of thing? A carpenter. That's right, he was a carpenter. And Jesus would have known all about being a carpenter, wouldn't he? Because we're told in the Bible that he was called, uh, Joseph was the carpenter, and so Jesus was his son. So probably when he was young, he would have worked in his workshop, because that's what people did in those days. So he could have been a carpenter. I'm sure he'd have been a good one as well. And next slide, please. Thank you, Dean. Now, that lady on the right. Oh, well, it's not very obvious. Oh, yes, this man's having his blood pressure taken. That's right. So what do you think she is? She is a doctor. That's right. So we thought of that one, as we didn't we? That's a doctor. She's telling him, um, you'll have to get used to living with it, probably, something like that. <laughs> or <laughs> or uh, that's what you want to do. To get better. But anyway, Jesus was kind to those who were ill, wasn't he? And also, he did heal people. He had a gift for healing, so perhaps he would have thought of being a doctor. Or next one. Oh, well, what's this man doing, do you think? Drinking wine, maybe? Maybe, yeah, he's drinking it. Yeah, I 
He's got his nose well in that. That's what you think he's doing. He's smelling it, isn't it? That's what you do before you put it in bottles and people buy it to see what it's like. He's making wine. He's making wine. Now, uh, Jesus uh, once turned water into wine at a wedding and all the guests thought it was the best wine they'd tasted. So he, perhaps he would have done that. Um, but surely he could have done this. Surely Jesus could have done this. What's this man doing? What do you think he's doing? Well, he's on a boat. It's not very clear, but he's on a boat. Someone who has an answer want to know someone else? What do you think? He's fishing. Yes, he's fishing. That's right. He's a fisherman or a trawler man. He's on a boat and he's got a, a, a plastic box there full of fish. And uh, Jesus surely could have been a fisherman because uh, he had lots of friends who were fishermen and, uh, and they had boats. And what he once told them where they ought to fish. He went, told them to cast their nets somewhere else and they, they did and he caught lots of fish. Now these are all good and useful jobs to choose to do, aren't they? But there are some jobs you don't choose but you're born to do. Can you think of a job where you're born and from the moment you're born people start saying, oh, I know what he's going to be or she's going to be when they grow up. You got an idea? Yes. <laughs> no, right. <laughs> right, not prepared to share it with us just yet. Um, right, well, I'll, I'll, shall I tell you? Shall I tell you? Can anyone think? What job you? What job you can never get unless you're in this country, unless you're born to it. Think of one. A king. Excellent. Excellent. A king is one sort of job. Oh, there we are. Now I didn't put a king's picture up there or a queen's picture because um, though from the moment they're born, they know pretty well if they live long enough, they're going to be the next king. Um, it's the job we have to wait for your mother or father to die, which is a bit of a shame. Now, I put a crown up there. This is a crown they get to wear when they're, they're crowned in this country. They don't get to take it home with them. They have to leave it fine. In fact, they don't even wear it out of the church. Um, but I didn't put a picture of a king up there because I didn't want you to think that there were good kings and bad kings, and you could tell by looking at them what they were like, because you can't, can you? Um, so I didn't, usually we have, a, we have an ugly king who's evil in the Bible, and we have a, a shiny one who's good. But, you know, people isn't, isn't like that. So you have to be careful. People aren't always what they look like. Um, so I haven't put a face there, but that's a crown you get to wear to show you're the king. But uh, we also have the coronation in a church, don't we? And I think that's to show that though the king's very important, there's still somebody who's more important, and that's God. And that's why in the Middle Ages they said, well, we're going to have the coronation in a church, just so they know that. Remember that now again. So next, during the last days of his life, Jesus was arrested and put on trial. And uh, he was asked by a man called Pilate, who's the governor Oh dear, it's a nasty piece of work, isn't he? He was asked by Pilate, who was the governor, are you the king of the Jews? And uh, Jesus said, my kingdom isn't of this world, because um, if it was, then my servants would be fighting. There's a picture of some people fighting. Now they've obviously disagreed about something. It might be uh, the politics, or it might be football, who knows? But they're not, they're disagreeing and they're fighting over it. And Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world, because if it was, my servants would fight to defend me. And they're not doing that, and I don't want them to. My kingdom is from another place. And so Pilate said, aha. And when Pilate said, aha, you have to be careful, because he'd spotted something. He said, Pilate, so you are a king, he said to Jesus. And Jesus answered, and the verse I think will come up. All right, thanks very much. Jesus answered, you say I'm a king, that is true. I was born for this, to tell people about the truth. That is why I came into the world, and everyone who belongs to the truth listens to me. So Jesus was born to be a king, but not like the kings we're used to. Not like earthly kings who don't always do the right thing. Whoa, steady on. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus is the perfect king. That's a crown. It just reminds us about kings. He's a king who tells the truth about us, not to hurt us, but to help us. He's slow to get angry with people. But he always helps those who want to be better and obey God. He's patient with us when we do wrong things, slow to punish, and quick to forgive us when we're really sorry. And he would even die for his friends, it says in the Bible. And so I think the um, question we have to ask is, is Jesus our king? He is the king, but do we act as if he is? How could we obey Jesus if he's our king? And what things should we avoid? Let's have a look at the next one. 
Right. This is a man, uh, he says, trust me, over his head. He's written, liar, liar, liar. Do we tell lies to get ourselves out of trouble or to hurt other people? Well, if Jesus is our king, we shouldn't <laughs> be doing that, and he'll help us to tell the truth, even when things get difficult. Next one. Oh, sad. There's a, a girl there, probably at school, and she's on her own, and she looks sad. And in the background, the blurry background, you can see some other school children whispering to each other, and I think they're meant to understand that they're being unkind to her. Now, if Jesus is our king, we should be kind to people, even to those, especially to those who don't have friends, perhaps, or other people don't like. We shouldn't pick on other people at school. It's nasty when people pick on us, isn't it? Another thing, another picture, something else Jesus will help us not to do. Now, that could be a husband borrowing his wife's phone, but I think it's somebody stealing that woman's phone out of her backpack. And uh, I remember if, we get, if Jesus is our king, then if we get the chance to steal things and nobody will notice, we don't do that. We are honest and we don't take things off people that don't belong to us. Another thing perhaps we do sometimes, yeah, well perhaps not the steam coming out of the ears, but this man is angry. That's what you're meant to see, he's angry. And something's upset him, perhaps something quite small, perhaps something very serious, but he's angry and when we get angry we lose our temper and we say things that are nasty and we do things that are nasty. And Jesus wants to help us with that too, so if we say, Jesus, you're my king, he'll help us overcome that. And lastly, yeah, women get angry too. That's right, there's one. She's very angry. It reminds me of the woman I saw in my car the other day, actually. But uh, <laughs> no, she, she's very angry. She's a bit of road rage. And uh, be careful about that, you know. When you're in the car coming to church, be careful how you drive. You might be shouting at someone else who's coming to church. So, now, we know that not everybody in the world tells the truth, not all the people, so we listen to what Jesus tells us first, we listen to what Jesus the King tells us when we read the Bible and we think about it, we can listen to Jesus when we take time to be still and quiet and when we pray, and we can listen to our junior church leaders as well, because they've got messages about Jesus for us. And if Jesus is our King, he will help us to understand and to be strong for him. Okay, you can go and sit down now if you like. Thanks very much for helping me. Now I've been asked to pray for the children now, After, then we'll have a hymn. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you that although we can't trust everybody in the world and we can't tell what people are like just by looking at them, we thank you you've told us that we can listen to the Lord Jesus and he tells the truth. And we thank you he is someone who understands us and we thank you that he wants to help and forgive us and he has even died so we could be his friends and go to live with him always. We thank you for that. And we pray now for the children as they go to the junior church. We pray that you will help them to listen, you will help them to hear and understand uh, we pray that you'll be with the teachers too. They may be given the right words to say and the right, word to, right way to say it. And that most of all, uh, the Lord Jesus and his Holy Spirit may help everyone to understand what you want us to do and what you want us to be. And we pray this, this, for this this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. Right, now we're going to sing another hymn. And at the end of the hymn, uh, the children will go out after the hymn. So our God is a mighty fortress. He is a sacred refuge. Let's stand and sing about our wonderful God.
children would please like to go. And well, we're just going to pray for the offering that has just been taken as well. So thank you, Lord. Thank you so much for these gifts. These gifts that have been given to support the growth of your kingdom here on earth. Amen. Let's focus on the cross of Jesus and what Jesus has done for us beneath the cross of Jesus. If we'd just like to stand and sing one more song before we um, have the reading and the word, uh, God's word. Can you hear me? Yes. We're reading from John 18, from 33 to 40, and the title is My Kingdom is Not of This World. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the King of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you say I'm of this accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from this world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. 
For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come to the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release you to you, the king of the Jews? They cried out, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Welcome this morning. It certainly is a privilege for me to be here this morning and to open God's Word with you and to share uh, some of the thoughts that the Lord has laid on, on my heart, and I trust that they will be an encouragement and a challenge and a blessing to you as well this morning. You know, it's a tremendous privilege we have as God's people to hear God's voice. And, uh, you know, I was thinking, sometimes we pray, God, speak to us through your word. And, um, you know, if we were listening, well, not even if we were listening, God's word was just read to us. God spoke. God spoke. Our prayer should be, Lord, help me to listen. He who has ears to hear, let him hear, Jesus often said. Uh, Now, I'm not saying that what I'm about to say is God's word. God's word was just read to us. Uh, It's my prayer that what we say now will uh, agree with what God has already said in his word and would help us to think more clearly about it. Should we just open in a word of prayer? Father, we do thank you that you've spoken to us through your word, that you've spoken to us through the living word, our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that we can gather together this morning to worship him, to honor him, to bring praise uh, to him, and to learn from him as well. We, we thank you for this privilege. Help me now, I pray, that the things that I say would agree with what you would have for each one of us this morning, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. What is truth? Pilate asked, what is true? Can we know truth? Can we know what's real in a world where uh, there's competing voices uh, from every side? Is it possible to trust anyone? Is there any way of knowing what's real, what's reliable, what can be trusted? Something that is sure that we can build our lives on, that we can take to the bank? Uh, Susan quoted a verse from Psalm 103 where the psalmist said, My heart is steadfast, O God. Can we, like the psalmist, find a, a rock that doesn't move, a foundation that cannot be shaken? The question of Pilate, what is truth, echoes today in our own uh, society, in our own culture. And I think it's affected us maybe more than we realize as well, even within the church. We need to be careful as followers of Jesus Christ. We live in a world that has rejected the truth claims of Scripture. And the world around us promotes the same lie that Satan uttered in the garden when he first tempted Eve to doubt God's word. Satan asked Eve, did God really say In other words, Satan was lying and he says to Eve, God cannot be trusted. And his strategy hasn't changed. He still comes to tempt our hearts to ask the question, did God really say? Does God really say? Now, as I've said, our society has rejected the idea of anything being true for sure, of there being absolute truth. Everything is relative today. Um, we followed the, the advice and the philosophies of men who were 
antitheist, opposed to God, rejecting uh, his existence like uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, who famously proclaimed, God is dead. Nietzsche also said, there are no eternal facts as there are no absolute truths. The implication for us as Christians would be quite severe if that were the case. Nothing is absolutely true. There is nothing that's eternal. God is dead. But it wasn't just people like Nietzsche who obviously rejected God, but Mahatma Gandhi as well, who we might look on a little bit more favorably as a man of peace. He said, nobody in the world possesses absolute truth. This is God's attribute alone. And of course, we would agree with him in that. This is God's attribute alone. But then he goes on to say, relative truth is all we know. Therefore, we can only follow the truth as we see it. Such pursuit of truth cannot lead one astray. So Gandhi says as well, there is absolute truth out there, but we can't really know it. Just each one of us on our own trying to figure out what's right. And as long as we follow what we see as true, we're not going to go wrong. And that's the, the view that many people have, right? As long as you're true to yourself, that's what you need to be. But this truth, this absolute truth you talk about, that the Bible talks about, it's rejected. As one philosopher said, the only absolute truth is that there are no absolute truths, which if you think about it is a self-defeating statement. <clears throat> in fact, we live in a world where any claim to truth or to know the truth is seen with great suspicion, right? Maybe you've had uh, or you know somebody who reacts to the claims that you might make as a believer or who would say, well, that's okay for you, but that's not okay for me. Oh, that's fine. I'm, glad. I'm happy for you. I'm glad that you found something that works for you that makes you happy, but that's not really for me. In fact, the prevailing attitude in our culture is one that says, you can believe anything you want as long as you don't say that anything else is false. We can all believe whatever we like, as Gandhi suggests, just follow the truth as we see it. But that statement really is just another way of saying that nothing is true and that no one should make any claims about truth because what's true for you might not be true for somebody else. Now we could illustrate uh, this thinking and I think it's probably okay to think this way in some areas of life. If I were to ask you in this room by a show of hands, who thinks it's hot? Oh, a few people there. Now, who thinks it's cold? Oh, we've got somebody from Italy. Wait, I'm glad you came, Sharon, because you helped. Uh, now, we won't pick on Sharon. <laughs> I thought maybe some more people here on the side where the windows are open might say that. We don't want to start a debate about opening or shutting windows. Uh, but two different people could come up with very different conclusions based on their own experience. I think it's hot, you think it's cold. We wouldn't say to one, you're a liar, and the other, you're telling the truth. Um, no, that's both their perception, their experience. One feels hot, the other feels cold. That's okay. There's lots of things in life where we can have differences of experience and uh, we're not contradicting reality. However, the problem comes when we apply this same kind of reasoning to things that aren't really affected by our own individual experience. If one person was to say it's 17 degrees in here and the other were to say it's 28 degrees in here, well, they both can't be right. One of them, or possibly even both of them, are wrong. But this idea, this relativistic thinking that whatever's right is what I feel is right for me and whatever's right is whatever you feel is right for you. Whatever's true is what you feel is true. Whatever's true for you. This is a, an aspect of our postmodern world and it's affected the way we view what is true and our ability to hold to truth with any degree of certainty. And it's actually quite frightening if you talk to some young people today, how relativistic they are in their thinking, 
how even the most heinous of crimes, the most evil of deeds, they'd be hard pressed because of the worldview that's been pushed upon them to say, actually, that is absolutely wrong. Well, it was okay for that person. Maybe they had reasons for doing that. And this mentality can lead to, and it has led to serious problems in the way people think, uh, both inside and out of the church. Outside of the church, it's left a world, many struggling to find meaning in life. If nothing is certain, then everything is relative. There's no solid foundation to build a life upon. Everything is shifting sand. There's no stability, no certainty. People can't say, my mind is steadfast, O oh God. And in this worldview, we take on the role of many gods. We become those who determine what is true, what is real. We live in created realities of our own making. And that uh, leads us to meaninglessness because we make very poor gods. We can't even trust ourselves. <laughs> we know that intuitively. We're not God. And yet we have a world full of people playing God in their own lives. But also inside the church, Satan's lie has left many with similar issues. Some in the church have become frightened of proclaiming, yes, God really did say particularly on some of the bigger issues of our time when God's word comes into conflict with the values and the standards of the world around us. Did God really say? And then of course there's the danger that we lose the conviction of the exclusivity of Jesus. Instead of holding Jesus in a place of honor where he's exalted as unique and different and divine, he's relegated to a place of an, one option among several that you can choose from. Um, Richard Neighbor, a Christian author who wrote the book Christ and Culture, he says, our preaching, I'm not speaking about here, but this is a tendency, sadly, in, in much of the church, is a God without wrath leading a people without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of a Christ without a cross. And sadly, the message in many churches is you do you, do whatever you want. And we've lost the standard of absolute truth. Now today we're continuing in our story of Jesus uh, life in the Gospel of John. Uh, if you can take your Bibles, it would be helpful because we'll be looking at these verses in just a minute to turn to chapter 18, verses 33 through 40. And in our reading today, we saw that Jesus was once again before Pontius Pilate. Pilate is the Roman governor of Judea under the Roman Emperor Tiberius. And in verse 33, we pick up the story after the arrest of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane and his trial before the uh, religious leaders, the high priest, and then his son-in-law, who's the acting high priest, the Sanhedrin, now he's taken to, to Pilate. Um, two weeks ago, Anang told us about these six distinct trials, right, that Jesus faced as he was illegally in the, in the night without proper uh, procedure, taken back and forth between these religious, cultural, and political rulers. And then Frank pointed out as well that these trials really were just kangaroo courts. They'd already come to their conclusion. They'd already decided on uh, the verdict. They were jumping over the evidence. And now we find Jesus taken before Pilate because the Jewish leaders really want to put him to death. Ever since uh, he raised Lazarus from the dead there in John chapter 11, they were looking for a way to kill him. But they didn't have the authority under the Roman rule to execute the death penalty. And so we find Jesus <clears throat> here before Pilate. And uh, our reading today, and it continues into chapter 19, John focuses on the interaction between Jesus and this Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. Before we look at the verses, it should be helpful to remind ourselves of the purpose of John's gospel. 
because I think the interaction here with, with Pilate is important to help uh, us understand the overall purpose, or it fits into the overall purpose of John um, as he was writing. Right from the beginning of his gospel, John is interested in the theme of truth. In fact, he talks about truth more than any of the other gospel writers combined. Um, 23 times in his writings, John uses the word truth or true. Right back in chapter 1, verse 9, as he's introducing Jesus, he says, the true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. The true light who enlightens everyone was coming into the world. And then down in verse 14 of chapter 1, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, speaking of Jesus, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So he presents Jesus as being full of grace and truth. Again at 16, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. How do we know truth? Jesus is full of grace and truth. Truth came through him. He is the true light. A little later on in the, in the book, and we're not uh, looking at every reference to Jesus and truth here, but in chapter 5, John says, there is a, or Jesus speaking, says, there is another one who bears witness about me, and I know that that testimony that he bears about me is true. Who is that one that bears testimony about him? He answers that question in a few verses, chapter 5, verse 37, and the Father who has sent me himself has himself borne witness about me. Jesus, full of grace and truth, the Father himself bearing witness that this is the truth. And then in chapter 8, verse 32, a, a verse we all know, I'm sure, and G Jesus said, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And then a little later on in chapter 14, verse six, as he's uh, telling his disciples that he's gonna have to go away, but not to worry because they know where he's going and they can follow him. And if you read the passage, the first few verses of chapter 14, you can almost hear the panic in the disciples' voices as the apostle Thomas says, no, we don't know the way. <laughs> no, you think you, we do, Lord, but we don't. And Jesus answers, John 14, verse six, a well-known verse. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus says, you do know the way to the Father. It's me. I am truth. I am the way. Notice the exclusivity as well in that verse. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then John, as he summarizes the, the reason for writing his, his gospel in John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, he says, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you who, so, sorry, so that, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So John, has, he tells us, I've selected certain things to write to you about. The other gospel writers selected a slightly different group, sometimes they overlap, but not always, of events to talk about. But John specifically has chosen these events that we read in his gospel with a purpose so that we might believe in believing that we might have eternal life. John is presenting Jesus as truth to us. This is truth, John says. And if you believe this, you can have eternal life. You will have eternal life. So back to our text in chapter 18, we, we find Pilate, as the Jewish leaders bring Jesus to him to find, um, to, to look for a way to get the authority to have Jesus put to death. We see that Pilate enters his headquarters once again, taking Jesus with him. He leaves the Jewish leaders outside and so it's Pilate and Jesus alone in his headquarters there. And John records this interaction which takes place as Pilate begins to question Jesus as to his identity. Right, the, the trumped up charges of the Jewish leaders that they had brought before Pilate in hopes that he would listen to them and, re, and act on them. 
was that Jesus was a threat to the Roman Empire. And as Roman governor, uh, the text doesn't give us any indication that Pilate believed these things were true. In fact, at the end of our passage today, he says, I find this man to be innocent. But he would need to assure himself for his own sake that these things weren't true <laughs> or he could be in trouble himself. Now Luke adds a detail that takes place in the middle of this conversation, which we don't have recorded in John, that um, Pilate sends Jesus off to Herod. Pilate and Herod didn't get along, they were enemies, but Pilate sent Jesus to Herod, and they both um, are united in their ultimate rejection of truth. They become friends after this, choosing rather than to accept truth, to mock and scorn and ultimately order its death order his death. All these accusations that are flying about, Jesus remains silent, but when Pilate questions him about his identity and about his purpose, he does respond to these questions. We know that Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah 53, that great messianic psalm, chapter seven, he says, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. The accusations that were made against Jesus, he didn't respond to them. He was on his way to the cross. His purpose was set. But we see when Pilate, the individual, comes and asks Jesus about his purpose and his identity, Jesus does respond to him. I, I see that as an incredible demonstration of his grace and his patience on a very personal level towards Pilate. We see in verse 33, Jesus, um, when he asked, uh, Pilate asks him a yes or no question, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus doesn't answer with a yes or no answer. I, I love his response here. As Jesus so often did, he threw his questioners and his accusers off of their game by responding with the question himself. He doesn't say yes or no, but he very quickly makes this a personal issue for Pilate and not just a matter of judicial procedure, but he goes right to Pilate's own heart. He connects with him as a person. He says, do you say this of your own accord or did others say this to you about me? In other words, Pilate, are you asking? Are you really asking? Are you asking for yourself? Or just because what other people have said? Do you really want to know? And Pilate's answer is very revealing. He doesn't really want to know. He does what he can to very quickly distance himself from this personal, invasive line of questioning. Am I a Jew? And I can hear there in Pilate's answer an attitude of, hey, don't intrude in my world. I already have my Caesar. I already have the one to whom I've uh, committed my loyalty. There's another who has a claim of king over my life and my loyalty is to Caesar. It's your people that turned you over to me. If you are who you claim, uh, they claim you're, you are, then it isn't working too well for you. What is it you've done? Why are you here? This certainly isn't what a king looks like. And Pilate there in verse 36, or Jesus, sorry, explains to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. He is a king, but his kingdom is not one of earthly authority. Jesus isn't another human king among many kings. His authority is from heaven. And again, this has been a theme of his throughout his ministry, and John has picked up on this throughout his book as well. Jesus often referred to his relationship with his father. He was sent from the father. He did what the father asked. He and his father were one. His authority actually comes from heaven, from the father himself. And in fact, when we get into chapter 19 in a few weeks time, we'll see that that is the real reason that the Jewish leaders wanted to kill him. Not because he claimed to be a king, but because he claimed to be God. The son of God, equal with God, 
But uh, Jesus does confirm to Pilate, I am a king. And one day Jesus will rule. We sang about that in our song. Every knee will bow and every tongue confess. But it won't be because some human authority has given him a kingdom. It won't be because a group of his ragtag followers meeting at night in a garden in the back of Jerusalem have decided to overthrow the government. When Jesus comes as king, he will be leading the armies of heaven. His throne will be eternal. He will rule in righteousness and justice over the nations. At his name, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Are you king, Jesus? You say that I am. And it's true is the translation that John used earlier. Some would say, you're right to say that I am. He doesn't de deny his kingship, but that's not why he's here at this moment, right now before Pilate. Jesus, as we've said already, is on his way to the cross. He's on a rescue mission. He's come to seek and to save that which was lost. To reveal truth to people about God, about himself. And that's what he says in verse 7. Because Pilate says, so are you a king? I'm not understanding this line of reasoning, Peter, Jesus. Are you a king or aren't you a king? And Jesus says, I came into the world to bear witness to the truth. And then I can imagine Jesus looking into Pilate's eyes as he continues there in verse 37. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. It's Tim and Pilate. Do you want to follow truth, Pilate? Do you want to know truth? Ultimate truth? Soul satisfying, transcendent truth? Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. But Pilate replies, what is truth? What is truth? Now, we don't know what's going through Pilate's mind when he mentions, uh, utters those three little words, but they've echoed down through history in condemnation of this man who had an opportunity here to believe, to accept, to know truth in the person of Jesus Christ. But without giving Jesus a chance to answer the question, what is truth, which Jesus has given all throughout his life, he went back outside to the Jews. And instead of accepting the truth, we see that Pilate, together with the Jewish leaders, come to an agreement on a plan to ignore the truth, to substitute, reject the truth, and come up with their own alternative. Now, there wasn't a, a tradition that the scripture tells us about that had been established in Judea, possibly even before the time of Pilate arriving there, that the Roman governor, in recognition of this important Jewish holiday of the Passover, would release one of the prisoners that was being held in the Roman jails on the Jews' request. And we see here that they choose a man called Barabbas, who John tells us was a robber. Other gospel writers tell us that he was an insurrectionist, Somebody who's guilty of uh, possibly trying to overthrow the Roman ruler rule. Now I learned something as I was preparing for this morning, which I, I wasn't aware of before, or maybe I knew it and I had forgotten it. Um, but Barabbas, ironically, his name is Arama Aramaic, and it's a composite name. Bar means son or son of. We see that elsewhere in scripture. Bar Jonas, for example, the son of of Jonah. Abbas or Abba is the Aramaic word for father. Like Paul tells us in Romans, we are um, been given the spirit of adoption by which we call out or by which we cry, Abba, father. So here the crowd responds, not this man, but the son of the father. Barabbas. And ironically, what they needed was the son of the father. Jesus, God's son. And so Pilate gave them the son of the father. 
But God also gave them the Son of the Father. What application can we find here for us this morning? What does this mean for me? (laughs) Well, first of all, we can know for certain, because of God's word, that Jesus is truth. Our hearts can rejoice in knowing that we know the one who is true, who is truth. There's great comfort and confidence in knowing him. He does not change. He does not waver. There's no shadow of doubt in him. His promises are true. Everything he says is true. We can believe it. We can count on it. We can take it to the bank. When he says, I'll never leave you or forsake you, he's speaking the truth. Martin Luther said, faith is a living, daring confidence in God's grace, so sure and certain that a man could stake his life on it a thousand times. I know not the way God leads leads me, but well do I know my guide. Many times, like Pilate, we might ask ourselves the question, am I a Jew? We try to distance ourselves from the claims of God's word, does God, does Jesus really have any truth for my life? Do I need to adjust my life to his lordship? And sadly, we often substitute many other kings. We say, we already have my, I already have my Caesar, we might say with Pilate. I'm quite happy ruling my life. Thank you very much. And we look for substitutes, substitutes that when we compare them with Jesus like Barabbas to the real son of the father, why would they ever choose a a rebel, someone who is a robber, a murderer, over the one who is truth, who gives eternal life, the eternal God? Truth for a lie. And often, sadly, we do that in our daily lives. We settle for second best. And ultimately though, truth is in a person. Truth can be known. Truth is God made man in the person of Jesus Christ. And as John presents Jesus as truth, and in this chapter we see it again, the response which truth demands is one of belief. I believe you, Lord. I believe what you say in your word. I believe the promises you make to me. When you ask me to do something, I don't look to another ruler, another authority, another king. When you say this is black and that is white, I say yes, that is black and that is white. The culture says do this or go there and God's word says this is who you are and this is what you should do. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The truth shall set you free. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Jesus said, and I'll quote those words again, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Only through Jesus, only in Christ alone, can we know that our Father, that our God, is the only God and the only, per- the only being that we can go to for eternal life. So let's stand together and sing, in Christ alone. Oh,
Let's finish our time together this morning praying in spirit and truth. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen.